Alliance today. I'd like to welcome all of you, those online and here in person, to today's presentation on accelerating adoption of new technologies in legacy environments. Today we hear from Salim Ismail, the best-selling author, business strategist, and social entrepreneur. A quick note for those on the webinar. If you'd like to ask a question to Mr. Ismail, please submit it via the chat function. We will collect these questions until the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Salim Ismail. Mr. Ismail is a sought after business strategist and a social entrepreneur. Having founded a number of technology companies, led Brickhouse, Yahoo's internal incubator, and was recently named an XPRIZE Foundation board member. He is currently the founding executive director of Singularity University and chairman of EXO Works. He is the best-selling author of Exponential Organizations, which reached number one on Amazon's bestsellers in business management and was named Frost and Sullivan's Growth, Innovation, and Leadership Book of the Year. Mr. Ismail currently recently founded the EXO Foundation, a global consultancy dedicated to solving humanity's most pressing challenges. Mr. Ismail, the floor is yours. that will indicate uh, hello you were ready for you okay you can hear me I'm going to assume you can hear me if you could click the slide for it I'll just give a little uh, context to my background and then we can get into the presentation so um, you heard a little bit about my background. Uh, uh, most, I'm actually Canadian, originally from India, uh, spent 10 years in Europe restructuring large European companies, mostly French ones, uh, which is why I'm bald, and that may make some uh, sense to some of you. Um, and uh, I've spent the last kind of 20 years in the U.S., and uh, 10 years ago became the head of innovation at Yahoo, running their incubator. And I learned a really fundamental lesson there, which is when you attempt disruptive innovation in any large legacy organization, the immune system attacks you, right? Because we can think of our organizations as kind of organisms, and they're set up for predictability and they're set up for efficiency. We try and deliver the same product or service uh, in like 100 locations using the same processes and KPIs and operating procedures and so on. Um, yet today, the the kind of the a higher level driver is really adaptability, flexibility, agility, to deal with some of the new changes that are coming and some of the disruptions that are coming. And so I wanna divide this into three parts. One is some of what is the basis of our thinking and what are, what are we seeing? Uh, part two is what are the implications of this for business and, and actually for society? And I'll tailor it a little bit more to the healthcare world. Uh, and number three is how do you adapt to this? How do you, if you're in an existing environment, how do you, what do you do to try and increase the metabolism? Uh, one thing I noticed is that the pace of change in the outside world now far exceeds the metabolism of our existing organizations, right? And so how do we deal with that? Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so the, uh, actually maybe the strangest phone call I've received uh, was last year from the Vatican um, saying the Pope has the oldest immune system in the world. And as he tries to update that organization, he has some interesting challenges on his hands. And almost all my work now over the last few years is how do you deal with this immune system problem? And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Singularity University. Uh, very briefly, Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis uh, put this together. Um, it starts with this orange graph that Ray uh, first uh, constructed. And it's essentially a graph of Moore's Law, going all the way back to 1900. And he finds that the, 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 the doubling in computational price performance that um, Gordon Moore from Intel identified has been actually been happening since 1900. So we've been doubling computational price performance every 18 months for over 110 years now. And the question that he asked when he saw this data is why is this curve so smooth and so predictable? Uh, through wars and recessions and ups and downs in the industry, you should expect a very jagged stock market type of shape to this, not this very steady progression that we see. 
And, and Ray spent a full 10 years trying to understand this because uh, it doesn't make obvious sense. And, he, and by the end of that, he came up with a really fundamental observation, which is once you turn any domain or discipline or industry area or product area, and you power it with information technologies and computation, and it requires informational flow properties, its price performance starts doubling. And, and most importantly, once that doubling pattern starts, it, it does not stop. It just keeps going. And that's very hard to get our heads around uh, because our, our brains are cognitively uh, are trained, our education training intuition about the world is linear. Um, and so this is the fundamental pattern now that we're seeing across a large number of technologies. Uh, Peter Diamandis, the head of the XPRIZE Foundation, wrote this book a few years ago, um, basically charting out that if we could harness this pace of change effectively, that we'll soon have an abundance of healthcare, education, uh, clean water, energy, in about a decade. And, and what does the world look like if that was the case? That's the basis of the thinking there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, Peter, as I said, uh, um, as was mentioned, runs the XPRIZE Foundation, where I'm now a, a board member. Um, some really interesting folks on this uh, board, including um, Ray Kurzweil and, and Dean Kamen and Elon Musk. Pretty much every board meeting now starts with, what did Elon just announce? And then we move on to the, the rest of the business of the day. Uh, but XPRIZE has found that you can give public prizes and totally spur radical innovation. And so the core insight they found is that if you spend, put up a $10 million prize, about $150 million gets spent on R&D by teams trying to win that $10 million prize. And so we've launched a number of those, the SpaceX prize, the uh, Literacy X Prize is now, there's actually a, a tricorder X Prize uh, that's been launched, which I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, next slide, please. And it, and it really speaks to this. Uh, it, it, what we found is that at Singularity, and something unique today is that that doubling pattern that Ray identified are now happening in about a dozen technologies. Uh, we have a dozen technologies where we are moving and doubling the price performance. I, um, in neuroscience, the resolution at which we can image the brain is doubling about every year. Uh, drones are doubling every nine months in their price performance. Uh, gene sequences is moving at about five or six months in its doubling pattern. And this is an utterly unique point in time. Um, it turns out that never before in history have we had this many technologies moving this quickly. You know, uh, in the past, maybe one technology is moving faster than another, but today we have a full dozen and that basket is growing as we use computational capability to drive the, the domain forward in, in these different areas. And at Singularity, we brought together the world's leading experts across these domains. Uh, Dr. Daniel Kraft, who runs the Exponential Medicine Conference, is, heads up our medicine and healthcare track. Uh, Divya Chander, who's the head of neurosurgery at Stanford, or one of the neurosurgeons there, runs our neuroscience track, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. And by the way, one of the unique aspects of Singularity is we spend about 80% of the curriculum teaching the future. Um, you know, most academics think about the past. How did this equation happen? How did this um, pattern um, model happen? We spend most of our time thinking about where will it go? And when then we challenge our students and our participants mm -hmm. to harness that acceleration and, and kind of leverage that to uh, solve some of the global challenges. Um, uh, next click, please. The, the, the specific challenge we give them is how would you impact a billion people within 10 years? And then we launch NGOs, for-profit companies, research initiatives, trying to con uh, kind of leverage this. Because each of these technologies is doubling, but where you see an intersection of them, that adds a whole other multiplier to the equation. And so the positive uh, feedback loop that comes from that is quite profound. Uh, and so we've spun out about 100 uh, startups each attempting to this goal. Um, uh, and I'll mention a couple of them on the next slide, please. Um, we have here one of them. This is um, one of our uh, alumni uh, working with NASA, and he's worked out a drone that can plant a billion trees a year uh, you, uh, using drones. Uh, which will be desperately needed as, as climate change starts to take effect. Uh, a little slow moving in its solution, but this seems to be the only viable. Uh, it turns out he can plant a tree for about 17 cents a tree using this capability. And so that actually scales pretty well. And we're aggressively helping him as fast as we can. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so we're, we kind of launched these types of radical things. And I'll, I'll come back to this comment that it's very hard for us to kind of spot this. 
uh, cognitively, our brains are really bad at spotting this doubling pattern and kind of really grokking that. Uh, an easy example was if I was asked of the folks on this call, how many of you had heard of 3D printing five years ago? You know, quite a few would put up your hands. If, but if we go back 10 or 15 years, very few people would have heard of 3D printing. But it turns out that 3D printing is actually 35 years old. It is not a new technology. Uh, but when it first came out in the early 80s, the, the price performance was terrible. Uh, you could print out like 0 0.001 widgets an hour. Um, two years later, it doubled to 0 0.002 widgets later uh, an hour. Two years later, it doubled again to 0 0.004. Two years later, 0 0.008. And you see that for a long time, it just looks like zero and you, everybody ignores it, right? Then it gets to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.6, uh, 3.2, and so on. And things start going crazy. And then we call it a black swan. And so we found that if you don't spot this doubling pattern early, it can disrupt you very badly. But if you can harness that, that acceleration and take advantage of it, it's probably the biggest advantage you could possibly have. And trying to get people to see that um, is, is one of the biggest challenges that we have today, given all of these technologies moving this fast. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so this is the uh, human challenge that we have in getting our brains to see this doubling pattern. Now, if we have a, double, a dozen of these moving at this pace, that acts as a massive forcing function. And we're seeing kind of four dynamics take place as a result. Uh, the first is pretty obvious. We're digitizing the world very rapidly, right? Um, our, brain, our memories aren't in our heads anymore. They're in our smartphones. All our, all our um, um, uh, social connections are now digital as opposed to analog. So we've digitized relationships, basically. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, Ten years ago, we had maybe half a billion internet-connected devices out in the world. We're up today to about 20 billion. Uh, Ericsson has made a prediction that we'll be at 50 billion within a few years. And very quickly after that, we'll get to a trillion, right? So we're going from 20 billion to a trillion uh, uh, internet-connected sensors in the next few years. That's about 2%. Uh, we're about 2% of the way there. So this is kind of incredible. Most of the disruption that we're about to see is ahead of us as opposed to behind us. Um, here's one of our favorite examples. This team out of Israel can take 10 seconds of your voice and just by analyzing the variation in the tone, can assess your mood and your attitude to an 85% accuracy on like 400 different categories. And there's a few other t companies working on this type of stuff, Emotive and others, that can do voice detection. But these guys just use tonality. And they, they used it, they developed it for uh, Air Force pilots to detect stress. And then they found they could categorize it in a large number of domains. And so the implications of this are really quite fascinating. You know, if a customer service teams are using this today. If an angry customer calls, what's the underlying uh, attitude? Um, can you save the account or you know, should you just hang up and move on to the next call because you've, you've lost them anyway, right? You can actually download that app in, up there in the yellow called Moody's if you wanna try this out. Uh, try this out on your spouse if you wanna have an interesting discussion about their mood. Um, that, that of course doesn't go very well, uh, but, but feel free to go ahead and try that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, by the way, they found in some studies uh, that this uh, technology is and may be a really good predictor of cardiac events, uh, just from the tonality of voice. And so they're doing some research uh, with some of the Cleveland Clinic and others to check this out. But here's a wild example. I was speaking at a conference um, that we do with CNBC. And while I was on stage, one of our alumni taped 13 seconds of my voice and he showed it to the audience. So that was my mood and my attitude as I was speaking on stage, which gets uh, quite unnerving uh, when somebody shows that around. And of course, he's totally wrong about the stubbornness there. I'm totally not stubborn. And you, and you see the weirdness by, this, by which that goes, right? Uh, next slide. And so this digitization that takes place is kind of happening across multiple domains. Um, and we found that this is very disruptive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the best way we have found of framing this is photography. Uh, some of you on the call are probably old enough to remember film photography. Uh, you're operating on a scarcity model. Um, you know, you cost about a dollar a photograph. It took a few days to get your prints back um, um, and so on, right? Um, as we move to the digital environment, three fundamentally important things happen. Um, the first is marginal cost goes to zero. And if we could uh, click forward three or four times, that would be great. Um, so marginal cost goes to zero because, because it's a digital environment. And now I can take a thousand photographs and the cost stays the same. As a result of the cost disappearing, the domain completely explodes. 
right? In film photography, we're carefully clicking here and carefully clicking there. But today we're essentially holding the button down on all of our devices and taking literally billions of times more photographs. The, the third thing that happens is very subtle, um, uh, but very um, um, disruptive, is that it, it, you shift the problem space, okay? So in a, in a scarcity problem space, I may try and sell very high-end cameras. I may try and offer courses on photography. I may publish books on composition to help people optimize for that scarcity. But in an abundance problem space, we all have eight copies of our photographs on like 10 devices and you can't find anything, right? Uh, uh, and so you've shifted the problem space from a sourcing problem to a filtering problem. And the incumbents in a lot of our industries, uh, uh, what used to be newspapers and then music and, but now, and books and now uh, hotels, taxis, et cetera, are, are optimized for the scarcity material basis for the world and the underlying substrate is changing on them. And this is part of the reason we're seeing such such disruption. Um, and part of the part of the um, uh, uh, difficulty is navigating this and seeing this happen, as I said, because this is happening across the board. If we could do a couple of clicks to the next slide. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, that 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 transition that we're seeing in photography, we're now seeing this in all of these technologies. They're all going from a scarcity material basis to a digital kind of an abundance basis, as I talked about. And let me cover a couple of examples. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you, this is one way I like to frame it. This is a 700 year chart looking from 1300 to today about on the cost of light. And you can see it was very, very expensive to light up a room or a building. Then it plateaus for a while and then literally crashes to near zero as we industrialize the heck out of it, right? And today we barely notice the cost of light. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and, and what's interesting here is the shape of the curve, okay? Because here's the curve for DNA sequencing that many of you on the call will be familiar with. And, and you see exactly the same shape, expensive plateaus for and then literally crashes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and here you, on this next slide, you'll see the price performance of solar and you see exactly the same curve. And what we're seeing in technology after technology, the cost is crashing very dramatically, right? which has some pro fairly profound implications. Um, and then now allows anybody to go and experiment and, and play with these technologies because the cost is disappearing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, let me cover a couple of these uh, areas. So uh, let's cover artificial intelligence very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. In AI, the reason that we use AI is that we've not had an upgrade in our brains in about 50,000 years. Uh, if, you're, if your uh, iPhone was 50,000 years old, you would be quite unhappy with it, right? Uh, and uh, on the next slide, you, you see some of the biases and heuristics we struggle with in human cognition. Um, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, you'll see the, the uh, you know, people have identified uh, saliency bias and co confidence bias and anchoring bias and, and sunk cost bias that we have. And we now can use data analytics to mitigate for some of these problems uh, in our human cognition, very limited by our, the way our brains are architected. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is one of our favorite examples of this. It turns out this is a study of parole hearings. And it turns out that if you came up for parole uh, just before lunch and the judges were hungry, uh, you're probably going back to jail. Um, but if you came up for parole just after lunch and the judges were biologically happier because they'd eaten, um, a 30 percent more likely for you to go free, right? And this is in people trained to be impartial, uh, for God's sake. So what hope is there for the for the rest of us? So there's a food bias, if you like. But now we can use data analytics and AI and machine learning to find these patterns and mitigate and kind of solve for them, which we could never do before. So this is incredibly exciting what's happening as we apply AI across the board. Uh, Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired magazine, basically said the next 10,000 business plans will be to take domain X and apply AI to it, right? And so I think we can see that happening as we look at startups around the world uh, and doing this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, here's a really crazy uh, manifestation of this. There's a team out of Japan that now has you go to sleep in an MRI machine. Uh, and while you're sleeping, they're storing the images coming off your uh, visual cortex. And they're, they, what they wanna do is play your dreams back to you the next day, right? And, and this gets, of course, quite unnerving in its own way. My wife wants to get her hands on that. I'm less, of course, interested in that. And you see the weirdness by which this will take, go forward. Uh, and so we're seeing kind of really surreal um, kind of use cases for all of these technologies as they intersect. Uh, next slide. Um, 
uh, and many of you are familiar with CRISPR. I won't delve heavily into this, but basically we found that bacteria can defend themselves against viruses, and we've now reverse engineered that. And we can, we're very close to now editing the human genome as easily as you can edit software. Uh, the implication being that our 10 trillion cells in our body are now basically a software engineering problem. And all of the techniques that we use in software engineering, uh, we can now apply to the human body with some fairly profound consequences. Uh, if we click a couple more times, um, uh, we'll get to, through this slide. The Chinese, of course, are em modifying embryos now. We found that we can now uh, edit HIV right out of somebody. Um, and there's some fairly uh, scary consequences of this. And of course, it's not a perfect and this is somewhat error prone. So the accidental consequences are having all the bioethics people in the world freak out uh, around us. Um, uh, I've been talking to the Vatican saying, look, how do you develop your moral and ethical frameworks and people can edit themselves, right? This will kind of cause some consternation in their circles. Uh, next slide. Um, we have, of course, an old word for this uh, and we call it breeding. Right. For thousands of years, we've been crossing dogs and cats and plants and animals to select for the traits that we want. You see on the left here the, an ear of corn. If we click uh, once more, you'll see on the right the image of what an actual ear of corn looked like 5,000 years ago before we started breeding the, the heck out of it to be bigger, juicier, sweeter, and so on. That's the film photography analog, right? breeding, where we mash together donkeys and mules and see what comes up out of that. Uh, we've gone from that analog kind of experimentation to the digital version. And now the whole field is actually called digital biology. And I think that gives a stark reminder of instead of thousands of generations of, of wild experimentation and some fairly bad consequential outcomes, we can now model all of this and come up with fairly accurate outcomes where, where, where things might go. Uh, next slide. Um, so that was kind of uh, AI. Uh, let me touch on the, the, if you wrap up some of these, uh, this is the $10 million Tricorder X Prize. And this was a $10 million prize for literally uh, the Star Trek uh, device that would wirelessly diagnose um, a bunch of conditions. Uh, if we click once more, um, the winner uh, would win $10 million when their handheld device beat 10 board certified doctors in its price performance, in their capabilities. Okay? So when your handheld device can outperform 10 board certified doctors, you'd win $10 million. 330 teams uh, competed for this, and the winner was announced two years ago. Uh, and very, very few people are aware of this, because it turns out that disruptive innovation always, pretty much always comes from outside your domain. And the implications of a device like this in, you know, in rural areas where it's hard to get to a doctor are pretty surreal, or in developing countries where we have a doctor per million citizens. Um, I joke that if you're a hypochondriac, you'll, you'll really love this gadget. Uh, in fact, you'll buy two of them, right? Because one of them must be wrong and it'll be chaos for a while while we settle that down. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, this is actually, on this next slide, you see one of the leading candidates called CloudDX. So these guys are now in FDA trials and commercializing their stuff. And so there's three, actual, three of the teams actually met the criteria, which is quite something. Next slide, please. Um, um, and just to give you a sense of the, the breadth of this, this is one of our alumni uh, uh, creating a company. They're using mass spectroscopy to do cancer detection. And they reckon they can detect almost about a dozen cancers in, in, at stage zero or stage one. So this will be really profound as we do early stage detection of multiple uh, conditions. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, and then you've got things like um, um, uh, Jeremy Howard, who's doing scanning of um, uh, lung scans to detect cancer in interesting ways. And of course, the focused ultrasound movement is one of my favorites because now we can actually go in and non-invasively uh, adapt some. I'm fascinated by what Neil and you folks are doing in that world. But I wanted to give you in this next little clip the, the, the breadth to which this is happening. It turns out, so the solar uh, may be the biggest disruption that we see in our lifetimes. Um, because if you can see the numbers there, we've actually been doubling the price performance of solar every 22 months, uh, roughly every two years for over a, uh, like 40 years. So for roughly every two years, uh, for 40 years running, we've been roughly doubling the price performance of solar. At this pace, we will be able to deliver 100% of all energy supply with solar in 13 years which will have kind of a pretty huge disruptive effect, right? The Middle East essentially collapses. Um, the, the, as a Canadian, I can make the joke that the U.S. has to find other reasons to go to war. Um, uh, all sorts of side effects of this area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, uh, here's the relative cost of solar uh, to other fuels. Uh, and you see the enormous multiplier there of how dramatically it, it outperforms most traditional fuel structures over time. Right? Uh, next slide. Uh, solar is now cheaper than the energy coming off the U.S. grid, by the way, and I showed you this graph already. There, there are two really important points to this, this type of a cost curve. The first is we have to remember that that doubling pattern does not stop. So if we had 100% in 13 years, and, and by the way, I mean deliverable, not delivered, right? There'll be certain applications like jet engines and so on that the energy density of of oil is too high and we need oil, but we don't need a lot to kind of disrupt the market quite heavily. So if we had 100% that can be delivered in 13 years and it's doubling every two years, it means in 15 years, we can deliver 200% of global energy supply. In 17 years, we can deliver 400%. In 19 years, we can deliver 800%. And that just keeps going. So energy, which has been scarce for the entire history of humanity is about to become abundant. Um, and this will have a profound impact on the world and in healthcare per hugely, because if you have um, uh, low cost energy, you desalinization becomes easy or water extraction technologies. And if you have clean water, you take out something like 60% of infectious diseases and the rippling effects just go on like that, right? And by the way, if you're worried there's not enough solar out there, it turns out if you add up all of our fossil fuel reserves globally, all of the oil and coal and natural gas we have in the whole world, that adds up to about five days of sunlight hitting the world. Um, so you shift the conversation right there from a scarcity problem to a conversion problem, and the conversion is riding this, this pattern. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now the enormous challenge is, is storage, and who can, how do you solve that problem? Um, and people are working on that heavily. Battery technology is lagging behind solar by about six years. But in, say, 2023, 24, when you have solar and storage uh, batteries at the same level of sophistication, it actually means the business model of every utility in the world disappears. Right? So that will be kind of um, fairly impactful in its own way. Um, just as an example of the impact of solar, a quarter of the farms in, in, in California are already solar powered. The country of Chile in South America is already today generating so much solar, they're giving it to their neighbors for free. Okay, that's happening today. And if we click uh, once more, um, may maybe the ultimate irony and my favorite example of this uh, is the coal museum in Kentucky is now using solar panels uh, to power itself. And, and I don't know how they look in the mirror on this one, um, but you see when what we find is when you have these kinds of dramatic transitions, you see these weird perturbations and weirdnesses along the way as people kind of get used to this new paradigm. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so I actually tried to live this myself. You know, if you're going to talk about this stuff, you have to experience it to some level. So a couple of years ago, I took a Tesla and I drove across the country. I went from Miami all the way up to Toronto. And you can see that, that the, you know, it was an interesting drive. But the car, I would get on the highway and the car drove itself about 35% of the time. So I'd get on the highway, it hit the button, and the car kind of drove itself. I made a whole bunch of phone calls. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, and But more interestingly... Um, if we click through three or four times here, um, we'll get to the um, uh, end of this. So six months ago, I actually drove it back. And what's interesting here is that I, when I drove it up, uh, the, the car drove itself 35% of the time. And you see at the bottom there, when I drove it back, same car, same sensors, but now it's driving itself 80% of the time. Right? And that's just better software, better sensors, that many more cars have gone down the road, better analytics, et cetera. Uh, and so you see the, a doubling pattern in roughly 18 months right there in the car capability with no change to hardware. And that's what's possible with AI. And I'm fascinated to see what happens when you, with the data coming back as people do ultrasounds and so on, the, the analytical capabilities we'll be able to bring to bear are going to be quite profound uh, around this stuff. Uh, by the way, uh, really importantly, this entire trip, um, um, uh, 1,600 miles, uh, cost me zero, okay, because the charging stations are free. So I basically had a private first-class train ticket where the car basically drove me across the country, and it cost me nothing. That is a, I call that a Gutenberg moment, okay? Many of you are familiar with the 15th century printing press where it, that one invention totally changed the world. I would argue today that we have about 20 of those hitting us at the same time. Um, just solar changes everything. Then you add in autonomous cars and 
batteries and AI and robotics and CRISPR. I think focused ultrasound is one of those, that level of disruption where it just fundamentally shifts the paradigm across the board. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, uh, we have this, this is an, a totally, as I said, a totally unique point in time. Uh, next slide, please. The, the implications of this are quite something, of, obviously in a whole bunch of areas, we are now 3D printing all sorts of interesting things. Ray talks about living for a long time. Um, there are already mice, experimental mice, that are living to an equivalent of 300 years old um, in labs today. So this is not a far-fetched thing. Um, I've been, one of the comments I made at the Vatican was, look, the business model for most religions is to sell heaven, right? Which is going to be challenging as we have life extension coming uh, as less people are dying. So that will be uh, something they have to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but the, my huge concern and what I'm focused on today is, is how do you solve this? Because our society is not set up to absorb this pace of change, right? In fact, I'll argue that every mechanism that we use to run the world, our civics, our politics, our legal systems, healthcare, clearly uh, intellectual property, uh, education, all designed for a world a few hundred years ago, right? Not for today. And definitely not for the, for the uh, trillion sensors coming down the pike. So we have to actually transform all of our legacy mechanisms by which we run the world. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in fact, I can't find a single institution uh, that is not being disrupted today. You know, journalism is fundamentally broken. Education, you know, our educational uh, um, systems are designed to take young kids, train them through their early 20s to be ready for the existing job market, right? Except we don't know what a job looks like in five years. So what in God's name are we teaching them? Um, and so those types of disruptions are happening. Uh, or on a lighter note, take the institution of marriage. Um, we invented marriage about eight or 9,000 years ago. Uh, and at the time when the institution first surfaced, average lifespan was like 25 years old. So you, you got married and you had kids and you basically were expected to die, right? Uh, marriage is not designed to last, you know, what, 50, 60 years. Um, uh, my, my wife calls that state-sanctioned torture, basically. Uh, and how do you update that, right? And, and this is the challenge we have in our institutions. You see this in sharp relief in, in, our, in the guild mentality we have where lawyers fight innovation in the legal system or doctors fight innovation in the medical system. Um, I, I think last year was the Texas banned telemedicine um, because surely you have to see a doctor for every little spot that you see on your hand and, and can't, can't possibly done by video conferencing or other means. And so this is the challenge we have in our world today. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to, to draw more into this in the, in the Q&A, but I'm work talking to a lot of government leaders, the UN, the World Bank, and so on, about how do you update our institutions in a general way. Next slide, please. Um, now, from a, from a, 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 in a number of levels, uh, by the way, according to any metric, the world is actually getting much better, uh, but you wouldn't see that if you watch the news, right? Um, let's go to the economics of it. Um, next slide, please. So what we find is when you digitize, uh, you tend to have a huge uh, deflationary dynamic taking place. And we see two things happening in the econ on the economic front. The first is the metabolism of the economy is accelerating, right? It used to take like 20 years to create a billion dollar marketplace. That's now literally happening in months, right? Uh, next slide. Um, this next slide pretty much shows the really the key thing that I find happening, which is that once you digitize a domain and you go end to end digital, uh, you tend to see this deflationary cliff hit. Revenues in the newspaper business uh, trundled upwards and then boom, there's a 6x drop within two years as eBay, Craigslist kind of really bit. And the next slide will show you um, the same kind of curve in the, in the music business when we digitized uh, that. Uh, and we went, um, at the, we had a 10x drop in revenues in that industry. And so huge um, implications for this. This cliff is hitting the TV business right now where media buying of TV ads is catching up to the fact that very few people are watching it, right? Uh, and, and then people put up more ads and less people watch those and you get up with this downward spiral. I expect this cliff, by the way, to hit the car industry in a few years, probably four to five years, as people use ride sharing or autonomous cars become prevalent um, in this space. In the healthcare space, unfortunately, the regulatory becomes makes it more challenging. Uh, but there are certain things that are occurring, we think, and your technology, your focused ultrasound world is a prime example of how dramatically the world can shift in a very positive way in, in that sense. Uh, next slide. Um, 
And and I want to go back to this, this linear versus exponential because I want to highlight how difficult this is. And this is the challenge that all of you are facing as you try to introduce new technologies in. Because what happens is the legacy thinkers in that domain refuse to believe that that's going on. Right. Next slide. Um, so as an example, when the when the Google car first came out 10 years ago, the cost of the LIDAR, the GPS, the radar, the sensors added up to about $200,000 a car. Um, uh, to for all the sensors for autonomous cars and all the cars looked all the car companies looked at that and said ah you know cute research project but you'll, but you'll never commercialize that uh, two years later it dropped to 100k and two years later it was 50,000 and still the response was who will pay $50,000 for all those sensors right we're now below a thousand dollars a car uh, in aggregate for all the sensors the uh, if we click a couple of times um, the cost of that lidar unit at the top of this Prius was $75,000 uh, six years ago and now it's $50 Okay, why? Because there's three or four technologies embedded in it. Each of them is doubling and the aggregate effect becomes an orders of magnitude outcome. And so this is the pattern that we see across the board. We're, we see this, of course, in gene sequencing and lots of other areas in healthcare. A uh, couple more clicks. Um, and the next version of this will, of course, be $10 and it's going to dematerialize into, uh, into like our smartphones, the way we saw GPS systems. And then we'll map the whole world. Uh, and imagine what you do with focused uh, with LIDAR, if you can put it through a pill in the human body and kind of start mapping what's going on, right? Or live cameras. And you, you folks, many of you are experimenting with some of that. Essentially, uh, the focused ultrasound is essentially a camera into the body. And I find that really fascinating. Uh, next slide. Um, this, this next slide may be the money slide. This is the one, if I could have you remember one slide, this would be the one. So what you see in the black there is the actual growth of solar energy over the last few years, right? Totally exponential, rising up sharply to the right, uh, up, and, uh, up and away. What you see in the colored bands is the actual predictions of the energy experts as they deal with this disruption. And what you see here is every point on this doubling pattern, the experts go linear, right? Like they just can't get their heads around the fact that it might double. And at each point they go, yep, it's going to go linear. Some of them are actually saying it goes down. I, I really just can't get my head around how do you think solar goes down? That just blows my mind. But you see this pattern. In fact, in mobile, mobile phones, um, Vinod Kosla, the, the in, investor, did a study and he found that if we saw doubling in mobile phones in, starting in the year 2000, we had 100 million phones. Two years later, 200 million phones. Two years later, 400 million phones. Two years later, 800 million phones. And he was able to draw that curve all the way to 2010, doubling every two years. And when he looked at the predictions of Gartner, Forrester, Jupiter, McKinsey's, he found that at every single point, every two years, they went linear. 10%, 12% growth was their prediction. And it was every single point, it was 100% growth, right? Now, it's hard to be more wrong from 10% to 100%. Like you have to, this is not a math error. This is clearly a cognitive error. And what I think the industry is suffering with, and every institution that we have in the world is suffering with uh, from, is the fact that our legacy thinkers are all operating in this linear, incremental, predictable world, and the, the actual world is going in the black, along that black line. And so uh, trying to get them to believe that, that this is happening is almost impossible. And this is what I call this immune system problem. You get this no response and they get very French and they go pas possible and, and you get stuck in that pattern. Next slide. Um, now the, the good news is that the, uh, so here's an example from Jeremy Howard who was at, for a couple of years the best um, data analytics person in the world. He finds you can do lung cancer diagnosis 50% better and way, way faster and it has an audit trail as to how it achieve, arrived at that decision, right? So radiologists should be technically uh, basically irrelevant today, but of course they are, they are not. And what we tend to do, by the way, let me, I just want to touch on the jobs thing. We, we kind of our amygdala and our, our kind of thinking automatically goes to we will lose all the jobs. Uh, we don't believe that. Uh, we, found, we think that whenever you have, as long as we have human problems, we'll have employment. Um, and we're not running out of problems. We just shift the nature and the boundary conditions of those problems. What we found with things like this is we just use radiology to do the higher and nuanced decision making and judgment that a human being can make much better intuitive uh, judgments, creativity, and so on that are needed for more advanced cases. But the rank and file stuff can be handled. As, as a stark example, 
when ATMs were first introduced, uh, pretty much everybody predicted this would be the demise of the bank branches and that we'd automate all the bank branches, except what happened was the opposite. Because the cost of running a branch dropped so dramatically, all the banks just created a boatload more branches. And the number of bank tellers has not dropped at all. But we've just created a lot more capability. So what we find is with technology, we don't get rid of the old. We just augment the, the uh, capability and potential. Right. So that's our view of that. Next slide, please. Um, uh, okay, so the last kind of piece of this is the democratization. Uh, uh, and, and if you go to the next slide, what we find in these domains is this is what's happening around this. A domain becomes digital, the costs disappear or drop dramatically, you get open source communities forming, and then you radically disrupt the, the status quo. And whether it's drones or 3D printing or blockchain, uh, we're finding this pattern, I think focused ultrasound is heading in that direction, where the hardware costs and the cost of running the machines is, has been dropping for a while, but it'll drop further. And at some point, it'll become way uh, inexpensive to do a, a treatment, which will have, I think, some really profound consequences. Next slide. Uh, to, it used to be that disruptive innovation was only possible through a big corporate lab or a government lab. But now any entrepreneur can enter a legacy uh, domain, apply new ideas, and apply, come in with a beginner's mind, apply new thinking, and totally disrupt it. Uh, Elon Musk may be the best example of this. He, he, of course, had no experience in the car sector, the energy sector, the space sector, uh, and yet he's created market leaders in all of them. Uh, and by the way, his methodology is very simple. He looks at a technology that's accelerating exponentially, be it batteries or AI or, or solar power or uh, whatever, and then he projects out 10 years. Where will that technology be in 10 years? And then he aims to build a company to intercept that curve, right? Uh, some of you are uh, familiar with the Hyperloop idea that he's built uh, or uh, open sourced. He wants to go from LA to San Francisco in 20 minutes um, at about 4,000 miles an hour. Uh, and to give you an example of this, I was chatting with him. And I said, Elon, I have a degree in physics. If you try and accelerate a human being from zero to 4,000 miles an hour and then decelerate them, you're probably going to kill them. Um, the G-forces and so on. And his, his answer was, was typically uh, him. He said, yeah, it's an issue. Um, uh, and there you see the kind of a stark kind of in stark contrast. There he is thinking, I'm thinking it's an intractable problem. Importantly, I would have stopped, right? I would have said, well, you can't break that. You can't beat that. And I would have not gone further. And he just goes, yeah, it's an issue. And he plows ahead. Right. And now I was half right. You do have to slow down somewhat. But the point is that he, he just kept going. Um, and what we find is now we have tens of thousands of entrepreneurs doing this. And you have quite a few in your world uh, kind of pushing for the limits of what focused ultrasound can do. And I think this will win out in the end, uh, indubitably. Next slide. Um, uh, I'm going to give another example of this kind of chaos and how democratized the world is getting. Today, you're, many of you are aware you can get these $100 headsets that give you a good fidelity readout as to what brainwave frequencies are going through your head. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, what you see here in this image is me in the silhouette on the left wearing a headset. And that's the readout from my brain in the middle. And on the right is uh, uh, taking the picture is Will Henshaw, who's the founder of this system. What Will is doing, he's, he used to play guitar for the Eurythmics. Uh, by the way, the band from the 80s. What he's doing is composing music that when you can play the music, it puts your brain in a focused state, okay? So a different type of focus than ultrasound, but just puts your brain into an alpha wave. And you flip, if you flip, uh, click forward and back a couple of times, um, whoever is controlling the presentation, you'll see my brain go flooded with alpha waves. And if you go back, you'll see, you'll, if you click back and forth once more, you'll see the, the difference, right? And so he's playing this music and this is now totally, I'm in now in a focused state. I wrote my whole book listening to this. Um, and uh, so, and think about how disruptive this is. Uh, like if you're the CEO of Red Bull, you should be pretty worried about this, right? Um, but you won't see it coming. You think your, your, uh, your competition is five hour energy and, and Starbucks and so on. If this takes hold, uh, it will totally disrupt you. And this is what I, I call this the orthogonal effect of information where people just don't see it coming. Right, and I think uh, your world is one of those where people will have a tough time seeing it coming if you're doing traditional surgery in any normal way. Um, by the way, uh, just as an example of that, it turns out that this music is way better for all of the kids with ADD and ADHD than any of the drugs we're giving them. Uh, and so uh, the pharma companies pretty much for sure are not watching stuff like this. 
right? But they need to do this because you need to now see where things might come and disrupt you. Next slide, please. Um, all right. So uh, uh, next slide. Uh, this is just a, a screenshot of this focus at will system. So the question then becomes, you, we can kind of get the disruption, right? We can see that there's these 20 Gutenberg moments that will kind of threaten our organizations. Uh, let me kind of go to the, me, the money part of this as to what do you do about it? Um, so I'll present a little bit of theory and then I'll go to the, the recommendation slide. Next slide. Um, so started writing this book um, a, a, a few years ago because we saw, saw that this disruption is happening on the outside, but our internal functions in any business or institution are also dramatically changing. Uh, sales and marketing, for example, is now almost totally digital, right? There's almost no analog version left to it. Next slide. Um, uh, but this quote, um, so I started writing this book, as I said, that, that kind of looks at how are new organizations adapting. And we noticed that over the last few years, we have a totally new breed of organizational structure emerging that's kind of uh, adapting to this world in a much more different way, the Airbnbs and Ubers of the world. Uh, if we click forward a couple of times, um, we'll, we'll get past the screen bump around this stuff. Um, uh, next slide. Yeah, there we go. So this is the quote that has been stuck in my head for several years. This is David Rose, one of the founders of Angel Investing, making the point that all of our organizations are top-down, command and control, hierarchical structures that are not designed for agility or adaptability. And this applies also to our institutions, right? And this is fundamentally what is the the pain that we're facing in all of our legacy environments is we're not architected for this. Uh, next slide. Um, and, and so what we noticed, and we looked at the 100 fastest moving companies in the world, and we basically came up with a definition of, of that they're delivering a minimum 10 times better, faster, cheaper than their competitors in the same space. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, this is the kind of index that we use to track this. There's now a hundred of them, as I said. Uh, GitHub, by the way, some of you may be familiar, which uh, allows you to do social coding and, and compare uh, notes while so developing software online. About 30 million developers use it. They have no workforce, no assets, no intellectual property, and Microsoft just bought them for $7.5 billion. Okay, so if you're not building one of these, your competitors are. Uh, because you can build a company today with with incredible capabilities. Next slide. Um, here's a, a good example. So it turns out not everybody does all of these, but if, if you're in a legacy business and you apply fully four out of 10, you get a 10x performance in your in your organization. And the, mo the model is basically that uh, all of these, what I call exponential organizations, have what I call a massive transformative purpose or an MTP, like Google organized the world's information uh, or uh, Uber is everybody's private driver, et cetera. Uh, brands are starting to morph into this. Coca-Cola's recent mantra is open happiness. Uh, Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, has now ordered every brand to have an MTP. So they're kind of pushing down that route. And then we find in the model that, they, that these companies keep a small resource footprint and use one of the five characteristics on the side to scale very quickly. Uh, Uber doesn't hire its own staff. Ted uses community. Google uses algorithms. Airbnb is leveraging other people's bedrooms and information enabling real estate in a sense. And then you have digital engagement models, feedback loops, and so on. And on the left, you see five internal mechanisms to act as the control framework and drive culture. Uh, Real-time dashboards, the whole lean startup methodology where you're also constantly testing uh, premises and hypotheses, decentralized org structures, and so on. Okay, next slide. So that's the basic model of what creates an exponential uh, organization. Um, so what do we do for large organizations? Because it's, it's one thing to say, how do you start one? But the more important part comes in if you have to, a legacy organization. So we have two suggestions. I won't go through all of them, just the first couple. The first is, for God's sakes, update your leadership that we are in a new world, right? And this is desperately needed, in, especially in healthcare. Um, it's very hard for our, our leadership to get their head around it. I'll give you the example of BMW. Um, you know, their tagline is, we're the ultimate driving machine. Uh, except from a technology perspective, we're pretty clear nobody's going to be driving. So that's pr a pretty big tension to manage if you're BMW. Every you know manufacturing specification, engineering protocol, design aesthetic across the whole company is saying optimize for the driver, and the world is going totally the other way, right? So a huge challenge there. But actually, Apple uh, has figured this out. Our strong recommendation, the second one in green there, is that do not do disruptive innovation internally in the mothership. Do it at the edge, pointing to adjacent spaces. 
right? So if you had a legacy hospital environment, we would strongly recommend against trying to put a focused ultrasound right in the middle of it. It'll just People will just go, this is impossible, it can't possibly work. Do it at the edge in a clinic uh, environment, at the edge of the organization or the industry or whatever, and, and let, let that become the new gravity center. Uh, Larry Page came to me a few years ago and said, hey, your unit at Yahoo is really successful. Should I do that at Google? And I said, no, you'll, you'll have this immune system response from inter the internal antibodies, but do something like it and point it into adjacent spaces. And you see the, you see the result with Google X where they have their core information management capabilities and then they use hardware like Google Car, Google Glass, contact lenses to go into adjacent spaces. The master of this technique is actually Apple. And, and, and yes, it, Apple has a great design capability and a great technology supply chain. I will argue that Apple's real innovation is organizational, right? Because what they do, unlike anybody else, is they'll form a small team that's really disruptive. They'll take them to the edge of the organization. They'll keep them totally stealth and secret, and they will say to them, go disrupt another industry, right? So they started with, what, music and then phones and then tablets and now music, uh, healthcare, uh, possibly retail cars, watches, there's literally no limit to their market cap. And so the, the organizational pattern we recommend is do disruptive things at the edge and don't try and bring it inside. Uh, if it starts to succeed, even then there will be the tendency to try and pull it in and you'll kill it. If it's really disruptive, it won't fit neatly inside a legacy organization, spin it off. Uh, next slide. Um, we're starting to see this happen a bit. We're starting to see some companies. So here's a company that's a vertical farm on the right um, um, with a guy sitting at the bottom so you can see the screen. And so uh, if, if, if you click once more, um, this is actually Ikea, right? So they're using their core capability to go into an adjacent space. Um, of course, there's a ton of extra parts left over when you built that thing, but that structure will actually feed a whole neighborhood sustainably. So we're gonna see some interesting patterns there. Next slide. Um, what we're doing uh, today, we're starting to see more and more of this, where companies are, and organizations are buying into the disruption that might disrupt them. Facebook recognized they might be disrupted by WhatsApp and Instagram, and rather than fighting them, went and bought them, right? So here's Corona about to pour $4 billion into, into weed, right? I guess, they, I guess they figure if they can't mess with people's brains one way, do it in another way, uh, slightly more uh, gentler anyway. So we'll see what happens. And, and Nestle is now doing personalized diets, going using a kind of a, in, in, in a remote area, trying this out. So we're seeing a lot more of this from large companies today. Next slide. Um, uh, so what we've been doing quite a bit of is this particular process. This We call this an EXO sprint. And we've designed this process. We piloted it with Procter & Gamble three years ago because the global CIO came to me and said, hey, can we work with you? And what do we do to update our organization? And so we developed this process. We've now run it a dozen times with big organizations like TD Ameritrade and Black & Decker and so on. And, and we find we can move leadership culture management thinking three years ahead in 10 weeks. Uh, and tomorrow, we're having a webinar to open source this process. We're actually writing our second book, which is a manual on how to run this process. So we're kind of, a, my thesis is every one of the global 5,000 has to go through this process with or without us. Uh, so what we do is we get all the senior management together and we do what we call an awake session, which is a kind of a shock and awe four or five hour workshop showing that you will be disrupted. Okay, So that's what we do with kind of senior management in a legacy institution or organization. I've actually run that workshop at the Vatican, uh, for example. Uh, and then we leave them alone because the senior leadership at a, at a legacy organization is pretty much useless going forward anyway. Uh, then we take about 25 young leaders, future lieutenants, and they do the work they divide into two streams. One stream is looking at what would we do at the edge of the organization to blow this open. Uh, think Nestle and Nespresso as a good analog. Uh, Nestle put Nespresso outside the organization and now it's a massive line of business for them. And the second stream is looking at what would we do to upgrade the metabolism of the mothership. And they report back at the end and if senior management likes them, they, they fund them. And so we've developed this program uh, where kind of the book that comes out tomorrow or that gets announced tomorrow, um, we're doing a webinar with Peter Diamandis and maybe Tony Robbins on it to um, um, kind of explain this and launch it and letting people go and run it themselves if they so choose. Uh, next slide. 
Um, we've also applied this to the public sector, by the way. We do this work with cities where we apply the immune system problem in cities. Um, we're working with, we've worked with the mayor of Miami on the future of public transportation. Uh, in Medellin, we've run it. We're actually doing a project right now with the president of Colombia and the Supreme Court uh, there to redo the justice system in Colombia, um, which I'm trying to do as remotely as possible for various reasons. Uh, next slide. I think that's pretty much the end of it. I wanted to kind of leave a little bit more time for a Q&A uh, than we thought. Uh, let me end on this final example, actually, just to show how pervasive this disruption is, and then we can open it up to some questions. Um, some of you are familiar with Soylent, right? So Rob Reinhardt, software developer in New York City, gets annoyed that he has to stop writing software every day to go eat lunch. Um, typical developer type of a mentality. And when he finds that when he goes to eat, he's eating really bad food. And he finds a friend of his lifting weights and drinking these protein shakes to build muscle mass. And he asks the question, why can't I drink a, a milkshake that gives me a whole meal? And it turns out it doesn't exist. Uh, so he spends six months with nutritionists and biochemists and comes up with what's now called Soylent, very badly named for the movie Soylent Green, uh, by the way, so clearly needs some branding help. Um, but if you drink this, as that turns out it's 100% of the carbs, the fats, the nutrients, the vitamins, and minerals you need as a human being for, the, for a day. You can actually drink this and not take in anything else. Um, in fact, people have lived on this for six months without taking anything else in. And they're like way healthier. They lost a ton of weight. Um, they're, of course, bored out of their skulls. If you drink this for six months, you pretty much want to shoot yourself. But most of us don't eat because we have to. We eat because it's there, right? So I could drink a glass of this in the morning and eat whatever I wanted the rest of the day. I wouldn't have to eat my vegetables, which is interesting. Uh, next slide. Now, most people, if you're, certainly if you're 40 years old or older, would patent this recipe and license it out to people as a business model, right? Except this younger generation is fascinatingly different. He open sourced his recipe. Um, and when he was asked why, if you click once more, um, he said, I have a massive purpose. I want to solve hunger. If there's an earthquake in, in, in uh, Mexico or a typhoon or a hurricane in Puerto Rico or the Carolinas, people should be able to drop uh, boxes of this in without needing me. And people said, that's great. How will you make money? And if you click once more, uh, his answer was, I'm always going to have the best. Sorry, once more. He said, I'm always going to have the best product. Sorry, back one. Sorry. if you can, Yeah, there you go. So he said, I'm going to always have the best product. So there is release 1.4 of his recipe. Uh, I think two clicks will give you the recipe. Uh, and so you see, you see here uh, the ingredient list for release 1.4. He's iterating his food product the way we iterate software. And it's, so food is now kind of starting to resemble software in the way he's developing it. By the way, version 1.3 had a bit of a bug in it. It caused gas. So if you see this on sale, you might want to be a little cautious of, for that version. But think of the idea that food is now a software release. And it's very clear where this goes. In the future, I'll send him a sample of my microbiome, and he will send me back a customized ingredient uh, set uh, tailored to my metabolism. And that will totally disrupt not just healthcare, but the food industry as well, and the supply chain around that, and so on. So let me pause there. I've got a final slide with some contact details and um, some talks, some further talks of mine, if you're so interested, uh, but happy to open it up to some questions. And um, Eduardo, Tony, I'll leave it to you guys to moderate this. Thank you very much, Salim. Uh, very interesting. Uh, can you hear us from your end? Yes, very well. Okay. Um, so one of the questions we've got is uh, you were talking about we don't know how to educate our children because we don't know where the market's going to be in five years. If you were sending your child to university right now, what would you have them study? Ah, good question. So I have a seven-year-old, and I'm hoping that universities got disrupted far before he gets there. So, um, but uh, here's the problem that we have in higher education today in a couple of levels. One is, if you're studying any of the topics that we cover, like advanced robotics or biotech or neuroscience, whatever, by the time you finish your master's degree, uh, you're out of date. You know, for example, in neuroscience, if you did a degree, say, two or three years ago, uh, now computational neuroscience has totally taken over the field, and, and most of what you learned is irrelevant. This is a huge challenge that the underlying subject matter is changing faster than our ability to teach it. What we deal, the way we deal with, and, and it, that's a structural issue, of course. It's not a, it's not a kind of a 
a bias one way or the other. It's just the reality of the nature of the, of the beast. What we recommend with kids is say to them, don't try and learn or uh, t- go to where the market's going. Pick the thing that you, pick the problem that you are most passionate about solving uh, and go after that. And so we try and steer kids towards finding the area where they're most excited about making a dent in the world. Um, and then pointing them towards the problem space rather than the technologies or disciplines that might affect it. And so we're seeing a lot of startups come out of that as a result. So that's how we guide people. We're very inspired by the way they're doing education in in this next generation. There's a whole new uh, form of education called uh, social constructivism that's kind of like Montessori and Waldorf plus plus. Uh, Our kid is one of these schools, our seven-year-old, and he comes home one day and we said, what'd you learn? And he, he said, I learned how to control my impulsivity. And we're like, wow, that's fantastic. You just get right back to school, young man. You know? And so this is a profoundly different way of learning, um, which is much more adapted to the world that we're living into. But we obviously education is a core area. I could go on for a long time. So let me pause there. Thank you. Uh, so this, I, I think you can comment on. Uh, it says Moore's law seems to apply as orthogonal innovations disrupt existing ways to meet human needs, power, information, food production, having your mind messed with, et cetera, quote unquote. Hmm. However, making the assumption that this therefore applies to a particular technology delivering this need, example, solar focused ultrasound, is intellectually inconsistent as they too may be disruptive. Some even get disrupted before they take off. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the question is, how do you predict where this is going? Because um, you don't know where you might meet a technological dead end. And I think that's a very valid point. And we find that you can't, it's hard to predict what's going to happen with one technology or another. Uh, um, you know, but when you look at something like focused ultrasound, just for example, and you see the dramatic benefits and the cost savings from it, then you are headed definitely in the right direction. But absolutely for certain, it's hard to tell. My favorite example of a dead-end technology is all of the telephones and all the airplane seat backs, right? Millions of airplane seats fitted with seat back telephones, and pretty much nobody ever used one ever except as a joke type of thing. And so there's a kind of a dead end where it goes. Uh, And we have a lot of those. But the general trend of information enablement and digitization is, is inexorable, and we find that continues. By the way, importantly, if, if you go back to that orange graph, which is kind of widely available online, you'll see that um, that exponential curve in computation has gone through several iterations, several technologies, vacuum tubes, relays, inf- uh, um, uh, transistors, now integrated circuits. And you can think of each technology as a little S-curve, where technology takes off, accelerates, and then it reaches its physical limitations, okay? But if you have an information-based paradigm, something else always takes over the curve. Uh, and so if you go and read the technology press today, you'll actually see a bunch of stories about Moore's law slowing down, the chips are getting too hot at the surface levels, we're down to a few nanometers wire thickness, and people go, well, that was it, it was a good run, but that's the end of it. But when we look out, we see a whole bunch of technologies clustering at the edge of uh, integrated circuits ready to take it to the next level. We have 3D chip design, uh, optical computing, uh, quantum computing is probably the most likely candidate. Um, but like anything, quantum seems to work. Nobody knows quite how. It requires a lot of alcohol to get into. But we're pretty confident that Moore's Law continues unabated, may even accelerate. Thank you for that. Uh, we're a bit over time, uh, so we'll close this uh, webinar down. Uh, if any of you listening have questions, we uh, encourage you to post them either on the Q&A portion here or on our Facebook page. And uh, hopefully Salim can get back to you with his answer. Uh, Salim, we'd like to thank you so very much for this extremely interesting webinar. And that concludes today's webinar. Thank you for all for joining us and stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations to future webinars. Thanks everybody. Uh, thanks for have having a great me. day. Thank you. Bye-bye then.